All right. Hello. So I'll say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where and when you're viewing this. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the next event in our webinar series. And this features uh, guest speaker, Dr. Victoria Chu, presenting a talk entitled At the Quantum Limit of Gravitational Wave Detection. My name is Garrett Cole. I'm the technology manager at Thor Labs Crystalline Solutions in Santa Barbara, California. And as a longtime collaborator of the gravitational wave detector groups at MIT, I take great pleasure in moderating today's webinar. Victoria is a postdoctoral associate with Professor Nergis Mavalvala at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and she obtained her PhD in physics in 2020 from the University of California, Berkeley. Victoria worked with Professor Holger Muller on trapped atom interferometers for gravimetry and test fundamental physics. And now at MIT, Victoria's research focuses on quantum technologies for the laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory, or LIGO. Uh, in April 2023, Victoria was awarded the inaugural Theodore Hench Prize in quantum optics. Throughout Victoria's talk, please feel free to submit any questions that you may have using the Q&A tool and Victoria will be answering these uh, following her presentation. So at this time, I'd like to hand things over to Victoria. Hi, Garrett. Um, hi, everybody online. Uh, Garrett, can you hear me OK? Cool. Perfectly, yes. OK, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation to give this seminar with Thor Labs. Uh, I'm very excited. We use a lot of Thor Labs gear in our research. Um, and so I'm excited to share with everybody kind of what we're doing with it all, um, and especially what we're doing now um, with gravitational wave detection. So the talk is titled At the Quantum Limit of Gravitational Wave Detection with the LIGO um, Observatories. Um, and like Garrett said, my name is Victoria. I'm a postdoc at MIT in the MIT LIGO group working on this. Um, so just as a little bit of background on myself, um, before I joined uh, the gravitational wave uh, instrumentation groups, uh, I actually did my PhD in atom interferometry at UC Berkeley, like Garrett said. Um, and this was sort of a tabletop experiment uh, trying to do um, gravimetry with laser cooled atoms and also test the fundamental physics. And we were doing things like doing trapped atom interferometers uh, to go for longer coherence times in these systems. And you can see here kind of the tabletop nature of the setup. While we have a lot of optics um, and we have a lot of vacuum systems, electronics, things like this, um, at the end of the day, the whole experiment kind of fit on a single table. Um, and we were a small group of just several people working on a tabletop optical setup for these uh, experiments. And now as a postdoc, uh, the experiment is much larger. Um, so you can see here, we're not just you know, a group of three people anymore working on a single optical table. We're a group of you know, tens to hundreds of um, scientists, engineers, um, all sorts of people involved here. Uh, and the optical tables are no longer kind of just one single optical table, but for example, one optical table in a human-sized vacuum chamber um, with a control room. Uh, and just kind of the infrastructure is a lot larger, although kind of the baseline of the experiment is still sort of the same in terms of, uh, you know, still optical systems, still mechanical systems, vacuum systems, all this stuff. Um, so now at LIGO, um, we are the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And uh, what is gravitational wave detection? And what are gravitational waves? So if we advance the next slide here, um, gravitational waves are these sort of ripples in space time. Essentially, when you have uh, two masses that kind of orbit each other, and then what can happen with these kind of, for example, large, heavy objects in space is that as they kind of catch each other gravitationally, they'll in-spiral like you see in this bottom right corner. And that in-spiral of the masses will send uh, gravitational waves that radiate throughout space. Um, so what will happen then is, let me see if the animation would play. No. OK, that's OK. So what happens as these gravitational waves radiate is that they stretch one direction, and then they strain the other one. And what you see is that if we have these two long laser rulers, for example, um, our two arms of our interferometer, one arm will get stretched while the other one um, kind of shrinks a little bit. And what we measure to detect gravitational waves is what we call strain. That's how we detect the ripples in space time that are sent out. And specifically what that means is we have these two long interferometer arms that form an L. One arm uh, 
Thank you. One arm will kind of uh, get shorter here as the other arm on the other axis gets longer. And this change in length over the baseline length of one of these arms, um, that strain is specifically what we measure here to detect these gravitational transient events in our universe. That's how the gravitational radiation here um, is picked up into our detectors on Earth. And while this animation, if you can see it, is a pretty exaggerated view of what happens um, for Earth, um, this strain that we actually measure from gravitational events in space is actually very small. We see the baseline of about four kilometers change by about 10 to the minus 18 meters. And that's to say we see about a two and a half mile distance changing by a thousands of the radius of a proton. So this is an extremely precise measurement. And the wiggle here is what we detect, detect these kind of astrophysical events. And so what you can see then is that we have gravitational wave detectors um, all, around the, all around the globe to help us do triangulation of the sources. And so in the US, we have the two LIGO observatories, one in Eastern Washington at LIGO Hanford, and the other one about an hour north of New Orleans at LIGO Livingston in Louisiana. Um, so these are our two LIGO detectors in the U.S. Um, globally as well, there's a Virgo detector um, in Pisa, outside of Pisa, Italy. Um, there's a Kagura detector as well in Japan, in northern Japan. And another observatory in LIGO, India, is expected to come online in roughly the next decade or so. And so we're kind of forming this worldwide network um, of gravitational wave observatories. And so maybe something that's interesting. Um, also, I definitely encourage if anyone is ever out in um, eastern Washington or near Louisiana, you can actually go and visit the LIGO detectors as well. Um, there are public tours. And so in lieu of uh, you know, everyone being able to go there, here's sort of a detector overview of, for example, the Hanford site, which is where I've spent um, a lot of my time. Um, and so you can see the foundation here just from an aerial view of our observatories of the laser interferometer. You have a laser in this building down here. You can see for scale kind of the cars in the parking lot out here in the bottom right corner. The laser comes into the beam splitter at the vertex. And then the laser beam is split along two um, arms, each of which is four kilometers, about two and a half miles. The laser beam goes to the end stations where the mirrors of the interferometer arms are. So it splits, goes out along the arms, comes back, they interfere at the final beam splitter, and then the interference pattern is read out on a final photo detector. And here's where the arm length changes across these two and a half miles. Um, we read out kind of these transients in the differential arm length. And that's how we detect gravitational events. And just so you can see a bit more inside of our lab, so from an aerial view now, we can zoom into the corner station highlighted in blue. Um, what you see then, this is a kind of an overview of what the inside of our lab spaces look like. And so you can see here, these are the vacuum systems that house those laser beams that you saw in the previous slide. And in fact, the, the arms you saw in the previous one, um, those uh, building structures kind of protect these vacuum systems inside of them. Um, so here you see the inside of our lab space. For scale, you can see um, some folks working on uh, creating some equipment around in the lab. Um, we can zoom in more then so that you can see what's inside of our vacuum chambers. And so, for example, when you look at the inside of the vacuum chamber housing the main beam splitter, uh, that kind of forms the center of that L, um, you see a lot of seismic suspension. You can see here a person for scale. And this is because we're making this incredibly precise measurement at the scale of, you know, fractions of the um, radius of a proton. And for things like that, um, to get that seismically stable, what we need is a lot of um, isolation from the environment, especially seismically and mechanically. And so our core optics, um, the main beam splitters, the main mirrors that we use for the interferometer are suspended on quadruple pendulum stages in vacuum. And that, that's what you're looking at here is the, is the quadruple suspensions that we house in vacuum. If we keep going, this is, for example, what um, the size of one of our optics are. The optics are pretty large in our experiment. Um, all these kind of main interferometer optics are about um, 40 kilograms. So it's quite heavy, and the optics themselves are quite large. You can see, for example, compared to our lead detector engineer, Betsy Weaver, um, working on the quad, quad pendulum stage. 
Um, so this is sort of a detector overview, so you can see kind of the different scales that are involved with our actual um, instrumentation. And so um, maybe now it's interesting to talk about kind of the dawn of gravitational wave astrophysics. And so what we see, let me see if that animation plays. Um, what you're seeing here uh, should be <laughs> um, essentially what happens with the merger of two black holes in space. The black holes will orbit each other, and as they kind of coalesce into one final object, it sends out exactly these ripples in space-time, and that's what we detect. And especially this event, this first event that we detected that kind of launched gravitational wave astronomy, um, this we detected in September of 2015, about eight years ago. Um, and you see here again that strain um, kind of as the black hole signal chirps through. And actually what we're looking at is two black holes, each of which are about 30 times the mass of our sun. They caught each other gravitationally in space. They kind of caught and then gravitationally um, got bound until they inspired into this final object. And these two black holes, these were essentially, um, at the time, some of the biggest stellar-ish mass black holes that we had seen. Um, they actually orbit each other and then inspire at a velocity of half the speed of light. So these are two objects, 30 times the mass of our sun, moving towards each other at half the speed of light, it's roughly a million miles per hour. Um, and in about you know a quarter of a second, they merge into one final object. So in terms of kind of extreme astrophysical events, this type of event is quite extreme. Um, and still you can see that on Earth, the signal it produces because gravity is so weak, um, the gravitational radiation, even though it emits three suns of energy um, radiated as gravitational waves, this was a still an incredibly hard and small signal to detect. Um, so black hole mergers, um, these kind of in spirals of black hole binary systems are one of uh, the very interesting things we can detect with black hole um, kind of detections that you just don't see optically or electromagnetically really, because again, these are dark objects that don't emit light. So unlike electromagnetic astronomy, like optical telescopes, radio telescopes, that whole spectrum of astronomy, um, with gravitational wave astronomy, we can actually see the kind of life cycles of these completely dark objects that are kind of zipping around in space. And so this is sort of a new type of event that we can now use to see what's out there in our universe, which is exciting. Another, oh, and then this, of course, led to the Nobel Prize in 2017 for this direct detection of gravitational waves from a binary black hole merger. And another very exciting source that we can see actually are neutron star mergers. Um, so neutron star mergers are another sort of dark uh, or neutron stars themselves are another sort of dark object in our universe in the sense that um, neutron stars, as well as black holes, what they are, they're the byproducts um, kind of in the stellar graveyard. So as you have very large stars that collapse gravitationally, um, they'll explode and they can explode and either become, if they're small enough, neutron stars, or if they're big enough, they'll explode and become a black hole remnant. And so neutron stars are essentially a competition of um, gravity holding the matter, pulling the matter together, and the strong force from interacting neutrons pushing the object apart. And so what you get are these dark objects um, that are just full of neutrons. And it's so dense that it fits about one and a half suns of matter and only neutrons into a gas that's only about 12 miles big. And so if you can imagine one and a half suns within, you know, something like a 15 minute drive, that's the sort of matter density we're talking about that's in a neutron star. Um, and so these events are, are very interesting, especially here um, where LIGO detects a gravitational wave strain. And then only a few seconds later, a couple seconds later, the Fermi um, gamma ray telescope detects a gamma ray burst, a short gamma ray burst. Um, and that's exciting because for us, what this means is that we can actually do triangulation in terms of the gravitational wave signal between the event detected gravitationally by the two LIGO observatories, for which light has about a 10 millisecond delay time, um, as well as the Italian European detector, um, Virgo. And between the gravitational wave detectors in the US and in Europe, um, we can already localize the source of this um, neutron star merger in the sky. 
And with the further detection by the gamma ray um, satellite Fermi, we can even further localize where in the sky um, this neutron star merger occurred. Um, and this is exciting because then what we can do is when, you know, once it goes from being, you know, kind of early morning when we detect this event on Earth gravitationally, then we can tell all the optical telescopes where in the sky to point the telescopes at to see this event. And actually, because neutron stars are the mergers of nu nuclear matter, essentially ultra-dense nuclear matter, um, they kind of light up the entire spectrum of um, electromagnetic astronomy. So we first detect the gravitational signal of this neutron star merger. We then detect two seconds later, consistent again with kind of astrophysical expectations of it takes longer for the um, gamma rays to kind of be emitted by the merger than it takes for the matter orbiting each other to produce gravitational waves. And so that two second time delay is consistent with the um, expectations, um, the astrophysical time delays that we expect. And then later we see, for example, the X-ray signals of all the, the fusion processes that happen as this nuclear matter coalesces. Um, we see those X-ray signals. We then see this kind of optical transient, again, light up the whole spectrum. So we see X-rays. We see it in the ultraviolet here, you know, later that day, that's many tens of hours later. And we then see the signal from these sort of kilonova explosions that have always been predicted to be the result of neutron star mergers, but never directly correlated. Um, we then see the kind of uh, fusion processes light up, for example, you know, all the way from the blue end of the spectrum to the red end of the spectrum. We then see the infrared signals as well, going past um, the most red of the red that your eyes can see. Um, and so we see the glow across all these different colors. And even a month out, we're still seeing you know, the radio afterglow um, of this astrophysical transient event. And here, for example, you can then also see directly with optical telescopes um, the sort of explosive. Uh, and what you get in the end is an, as a transient feature um, that optical telescopes can pick up when they point to the same location in the sky that we detected the gravitational waves from. So that's very exciting. And so this was sort of the dawn of sort of multi-messenger observations with gravitational wave signals that you know, are dark, again, not emitting light, as well as electromagnetic follow-up of the source that we first detected in gravitational waves. And this is very exciting because this involves telescopes all across the electromagnetic spectrum again, and signals that start just before the first electromagnetic signals, like the gravitational wave signal, out to a month after. Um, so this is, this is very exciting to detect uh, these sort of multi-messenger observations, gravitational waves. And for example, some things that we learn from doing this are we can see where do heavy elements in the universe get formed. Stars are essentially hydrogen and helium. And how do we get elements that are heavier like gold and silver? And it turns out a lot of that, based on this optical spectroscopy of um, a binary neutron star merger, we can see that a lot of heavy elements are formed by the mergers of this nuclear matter, um, which is an exciting thing to study. So going forward, that was sort of the science we got up to in our first catalog, which included events from the first and second um, observing runs of um, LIGO and Virgo. After the first two observing runs, um, that's about a year of observing time, we had about 11 events. And you can see here that the signatures, the gravitational signatures of events from binary black hole systems um, are very different than the signals that we get from binary neutron star systems. And that's in essence because black holes are massive, they're much heavier than neutron stars, and so they move much more slowly. And because they're more massive, their in-spiral signals are higher amplitude. That's why you can see these, uh, these chirps out to greater strengths, higher amplitudes at the end of the chirp, as well they're slower because these objects are more massive and so they orbit each other slower unlike binary neutron star signals, which are kind of fast and zippy because the objects are so light, but then also produce weaker gravitational wave signals because the objects are so small. And then in our detectors, in terms of our instrumentation, after the first two observing runs, you see the 11 events we've had here. Um, what then happens is a dramatic increase in the rate 
of detections with the third observing run. The third observing run was basically from 2019 till 2020, just before the pandemic. Um, and a major part of increasing our sensitivity for the third observing run was the addition of quantum squeezing into the detectors. And here you can see compared to the um, black on the left here is showing the detector noise. That means you want this curve to be as low as possible. The black is showing the detector noise without quantum enhancement. And the green is showing the detector noise with quantum enhancement. And you can see the dramatic um, reduction in detector noise when we reduce the quantum noise in the detectors. And this was a large part of um, you know, the increased detection rate going into the third observing run. And if you look at what does this increased noise from black to green mean in terms of our astrophysical output and gravitation wave detectors? When you look here, what we go from in the first two observing runs, uh, we then, after one year of observing, uh, get all the additional purple observations. And what you can see is that 3 dB of quantum noise reduction, that's to say, um, a twofold reduction um, of the amount of noise power from quantum noise. That's a twofold shot noise power reduction. Um, that's a difference for us between monthly to weekly detections of gravitational wave transients. And so that's an exciting application, I think, of quantum engineering in terms of how can we really um, develop and deploy quantum technologies in ways that are really meaningful to us and that give us access to science that we really could not access without um, this kind of quantum enhancement. And we see that our observational horizons for the same amount of observing time, we have so many more detections. Um, and that's a real kind of payoff of quantum engineering in this context for gravitational wave detection. And if you look more again at what have we really learned astrophysically, we've learned a lot, um, which is cool to see. So here on the bottom line, you see the yellow and then the red dots there. Those are the sources in this band, in this um, stellar graveyard, so to speak, that is the dark objects left over after um, stars kind of explode, go supernova, and then collapse into a final object. With electromagnetic astronomy down here in yellow and red, we've seen neutron stars, and we've seen light black holes indirectly. Um, with the addition of gravitational wave detection, we've actually been able to see much more. We've been able to see, for example, it's been theoretically predicted, and now we've observed the mergers of neutron stars with black holes. We've observed objects in, there's in principle should be a mass gap theoretically between the heaviest neutron star and the lightest black hole. We've observed objects that we are still trying to, learning how to understand what actually they are because they fall into the gap between the heaviest neutron stars and the lowest black holes. Um, and we've seen objects that are in several mass gaps. For example, the mass gap um, between merging uh, black holes. And we've also started to probe. You can see in blue here all the objects we've seen with gravitational wave detectors now, um, heavy uh, stellar mass black holes. And what that means is that there are roughly black holes that are similar to the mass of the sun. That's what we call, these are what we call these stellar mass black holes. However, on the totally other end, there are black holes that are supermassive black holes. And those are the ones you see these beautiful pictures of their accretion disks because supermassive black holes anchor a galaxy. Um, and those supermassive black holes are about a million solar masses, as opposed to the stellar mass black holes, which are about a hundred solar masses. And actually there's this gigantic mass gap, right, between 100 solar masses and a million to a billion solar mass supermass black holes. Um, and so in that mass gap, actually, um, intermediate mass black holes in that range have not really been directly observed. And that is a huge open problem of why we haven't observed it, whether it's a detection issue, is there some other astrophysical reason for this? Um, and so what we can do with black hole detectors is push into that intermediate mass black hole um, mass gap and try to see what are the heaviest black holes. And already um, so far with gravitational wave astronomy, we've seen that there are heavy black holes out there, much heavier than we've ever seen with only electromagnetic astronomy. And that's exciting to see. And so there's a lot of astrophysical return in um, as we increase the sensitivity of our detectors. And so 
how do we keep increasing the sensitivity of our detectors and how do we push towards kind of unlocking this new type of astrophysics with um, our instrumentation in laser interferometers? Um, what we talk about, the thing we keep in mind is signal to noise, right? So we have to think about what do our signals look like and what is the profile of our noise and how can we optimize the detection? So in terms of the signal, Black hole signals, again, are in this kind of 100 hertz range. That's where we have the most sensitivity to black holes. These are higher amplitude signals. Neutron star signals, the um, pre, the signals before the mergers, that early warning signal that we can get from them, that's kind of in the lower frequency band. But um, these higher frequency ring down um, signals from the post-merger uh, kind of physics, this post-merger neutron star physics, that's where a lot of things, for example, how round is a neutron star? Um, is it exactly round? Is it, does it have like maybe a millimeter of a hill on one side of it? These are the sorts of questions um, that we can answer by getting a high resolution um, detection of the post-merger signal. Um, so in the context of we need high sensitivity, in terms of the astrophysics around 100 hertz going into the kilohertz. Um, that's what we see when we look astrophysically at the signals that, that we want to detect. And then we think about our detector noise. And we think um, when we look at this, we try to break down what are the different um, major noise sources and we try to figure out how to address that. And just in terms of um, historically leading to today, um, between the first observing run and now um, we are now a few months into the fourth observing run, you can see that our noise has improved, meaning the noise has uh, gotten lower. So these curves that you see in strange get lower because that's showing you the noise. Um, as the noise gets lower, our detection rates get higher. Um, and the way that we make progress is again by understanding if we take, for example, the third observing run, and we look at the breakdown of noise in this run. We can see what are the major contributors to the noise, and we can try to understand um, where what we can do then to improve. And here, what you see, if we break down the noise from the third observing run, what this plot is showing you is as a function of frequency on the horizontal axis, how much noise do we have at each frequency in units of the strain signal we're trying to detect. Um, so the noise at a given frequency, you can see that across most of our detection frequency band here. And again, notice that the detection band is about 10 hertz to 5 kilohertz, which is a challenging range um, mechanically because that's also where all the kind of, you know, human and seismic noise on Earth lies. Um, but in the, across this range, what you see is the dominant noise is quantum shot noise. And that's exactly the noise we can address by increasing laser power that decreases shot noise in these units. And also the addition of squeezing um, decreases the impact of shot noise as well. Um, what you see at the lower end here um, in orange is quantum radiation pressure noise. This is essentially the back action component from quantum shot noise. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, and so you see is really kind of across the band, quantum noise is a defining um, limit to our sensitivity. And this is why quantum engineering has so much impact in terms of our astrophysical um, observation rates. And to point out here as well, this brown curve is now starting to become more important than ever as we decrease the blue and the orange curves. Um, we start to be really limited by this thermal noise and this is um, the Brownian motion of the coatings in our mirrors, and because that's not common to the interferometer that shows up as a differential signal right in our most astrophysically sensitive region. And so this thermal noise will become as well a defining noise um, in the decade to come. And so when you break down the quantum noise, what you see is that as we increase and grain the sensitivity, we can increase the sensitivity with respect to no squeezing in black, but we do start to lose because we also um, squeeze the shot noise, but then we increase the back action noise. And as we keep going down this route, the back action noise starts to become the defining issue for us. And so what we have now done in the fourth observing run is compared to no squeezing again in black, if we had continued with the traditional squeezing that we had done, we would get the green as before. And you can see how much worse this is than the black. 
And what we've done now is add in a filter cavity to inject frequency dependent squeezing. That's to say a more optimal preparation of the squeeze state matching the dynamics of the interferometer. And so that, um, that has actually been able to successfully overcome the limits of back action in our detectors now. And so there's, this is a major upgrade to the experiment and I'll talk a little bit about that going forward, um, what that really looks like. And just to talk briefly about quantum noise in an interferometer again, it's due to the vacuum fluctuations that are at the output port. It's a measurement noise that kind of comes in after we've acquired the signal. That's how shot noise impacts our experiment. And so what we need to do is squeeze the shot noise level at the output photodetectors. And this kind of tug of war that squeezing is, is um, because these two forms of noise, we can improve one at the cost of the other. That's to say, because there's a Heisenberg limit to the um, best noise power we can have, we can reduce the noise in, for example, delta P, but then we increase the noise in delta X. Same if we, de if we get less noise in delta X, we have more noise in delta P because their product is fixed. That's how Heisenberg uncertainty plays into this context. And you can see here that as we inject quantum squeezing, what we're really doing again in terms of signal to noise ratio and detection is that for the same size of signal, we're reducing the white shot noise at the output port. That, um, and what you get in the end is with the same signal and less noise, you get higher resolution of the astrophysical signal. And that's in some sense how this works. And just to be clear here, so shot noise is a result in our interferometer um, of fluctuations in the vacuum phase noise at the detector. So vacuum phase fluctuations at the output port um, and quantum radiation pressure noise is actually kind of an interesting form of back action. Um, so this is actually a result of amplitude fluctuations at the output port. And while shot noise is a problem at high frequencies beyond the kilohertz range, um, quantum radiation pressure noise is really an issue in our most astrophysically sensitive range below 100 hertz. And what you can see here, just to say it again, is that normally laser Laser light, for example, um, at the output of your interferometer, it's a function of the phase. You see a sine wave for laser light. What vacuum and quantum noise does, it's essentially the fuzz um, not read out the signal. So it's this, the quantum noise is really kind of this fuzz on the sine wave up here. What you can see when we inject squeezing is that if we inject phase squeezing, for example, there's less fuzz um, at the phase quadrature, that's to say around um, the middle axis line here, there's less phase noise. And what that physically means is that if we have less phase noise, we must have more amplitude noise. And that's exactly what drives quantum radiation pressure is how when we reduce phase noise, we increase amplitude noise. That increase in vacuum amplitude noise goes on to push our mirrors in a detectable way. And that is exactly what we um, become limited by at low frequencies. How this increase in vacuum amplitude noise drives our mirrors, which are suspended and thus susceptible to that motion. Um, and so that's kind of the context here. And for shot noise, this is again what we reduced in the third observing run. And for quantum radiation pressure noise, that's what our now upgrade to frequency dependent squeezing has allowed us to also overcome. Um, and so there, we inject squeeze light using a nonlinear optical crystal. Um, and I'll keep going for now just to show you that this compromise here, again, when we increase shot noise, um, or sorry, when we decrease shot noise, we also increase radiation pressure noise. Let's see if this works. So for the fourth observing run with frequency dependent squeezing, what we do is we reflect the squeeze light going into the interferometer instead off of an optical filter cavity. And what that does is it gives a phase shift between high and low frequencies. It gives a relative phase shift between, um, for example, where it's resonant, it'll give a 90 degree phase shift and off resonant, it'll give a 180 degree phase shift to the squeeze light. And what that allows us to do is again, because at low frequencies we're limited by amplitude noise, what we're going to send in is amplitude squeeze light at low frequencies. That's figure C here, where there's very little amplitude drive for the interferometer. While at high frequencies, we're doing the same squeezing as before, doing phase squeezing um, to reduce the phase noise that gives rise to shot noise.
And so what really we're doing is changing in a frequency dependent way, um, whether we're doing amplitude squeezing in band of amplitude noise and phase squeezing in band of phase noise in our detectors. And really what that means is we are optimally preparing the injected squeeze state. We're optimally kind of engineering the vacuum state at the output to match the dynamics of the interferometer. And that allows us to cancel quantum noise across the entire detection band. Um, and this is very exciting because it means that we can really kind of now do quantum noise reduction in the full interferometers without the consequences of back action. For example, we can reduce the shot noise without also um, facing the increase in um, kind of the consequences from increased amplitude noise associated with the decrease in shot noise. And so that's exciting. And what this plot is showing you here on the left is just that as we reduce, um, as we change the squeezing angle, what we're really doing with frequency dependent squeezing is picking the optimal squeezing angle across the whole band and preparing that state. And just to show you a little bit more, um, we designed the filter cavity with that in mind. Um, so that's to say we have a very long optical storage time to realize this phase delay. So we have actually a three millisecond optical storage time for the squeeze state, which requires the filter cavity to be both um, high finesse, that is many, many round trips, as well as almost nearly lossless. So we don't degrade the squeeze state. And the, the full design is a little bit complicated, um, but this is something I'm excited to show because this is again a ThorLab seminar. Um, so we have in-air tables that prepare the squeeze light, and we have the squeezer actually pumped in vacuum and interfacing our full interferometer in vacuum. And so I can show you for the in-air tables, you might see a lot of um, recognizable parts on our in-air tables that um, prepare the light for the squeezer. And then, for example, our in-vacuum squeezer, um, this is often more custom because it all has to be vacuum compatible with the full LEGO interferometers. As well, we need our own um, special vibration isolation and seismic isolation for the optics, for the platforms, and for, the, in fact, the entire optical table is is actively isolated here. Um, so this is, for example, the in-vacuum part of pumping the squeezer um, and then sending the light into, for example, this triple suspension stage here that houses the filter cavities input mirror. And then here you can see our interface of the full interferometer. You can kind of see the scale again of the system. There are vacuum systems here to interface the squeezer in this uh, chamber here through this tube. That's this tube you see here. And then going into the full interferometer and back out to the output mode cleaners here and the final photo detectors for detection. Again, all of that is housed here. So here the squeeze light is generated, sent into the full interferometer, circulated to the main interferometer, and read out in this final chamber here. And just to show you some more of, for example, what this install really looks like, um, you can see here there are many people involved on sites with all the installation. Again, you can see our suspension infrastructure and the fully populated vacuum system there. As well, because we had to build this filter cavity to be 300 meters long, um, that was actually required building a new um, beam tube and a new uh, building to house the final filter cavity mirror. So you can see when we went down for commissioning in the commissioning break between 03 and 04, we were down from about 2020 to May 2023. Um, again, we were building out this 300 meters. That was laying the concrete for the beam tube, um, installing the beam tube, baking it out, installing the new building, installing the, the new mirrors and everything um, here. So that, that construction process took a couple of years to get that all fully finished. And now today you can see the new 300 meter filter cavity for frequency dependent squeezing kind of running throughout our labs here, as well as throughout the new beam tube enclosures here. And here what you can see is that um, after a couple of years of this um, installation, while we were down for about three years, we see um, right around Thanksgiving in 2022, we we're able to open all the, the gate valves, that's to say let all the light finally pass through this tube and get the first light through the cavities and see the first locks at both detectors, which is very exciting, um, and start to see the first signs of frequency dependent squeezing. And here what you might notice, this is just some random kind of sampling of the people involved with commissioning the filter cavity. So this is really um, 
a big team effort involving lots of grad students, lots of postdocs like me, also many um, scientists, engineers. Um, so really a lot of different types of expertise here. And going into the start of the fourth observing run, which started in May 2023, um, both sites have reached the goals, um, have been able to reach the goals for the fourth observing run for four and a half dBs of frequency dependent squeezing. That's about a 65 um, percent decrease in quantum noise power across the entire detection band. You can see that at both observatories in Eastern Washington and Hanford, as well as in Louisiana and Livingston, we've been able to kind of circumvent the impacts of back action there at the full scale of both detectors. As well, the whole um, process of locking the filter cavity and operating it um, has been made very robust. And leading into the observing run, we had already seen, for example, 18 hours here. And now we've been able to operate continuously with the squeeze system online in its nominal configuration for you know, 60 to 100 hours at a time. And so that's exciting to be able to kind of get this technology um, working at this scale with that sort of robustness. And now here we are about four months into the fourth observing run where what we had um, here after 10 months of observing the third observing run, we had about 56 online candidates detected. And now about four months into the fourth observing run, we have already about 40 events detected. And so the detection rates are increasing rapidly as we improve the um, detector sensitivity from black to essentially purple here with frequency dependent squeezing. And now in 04, frequency dependent squeezing is the nominal observing configuration for the LIGO detectors. Um, and so this is very exciting with this 30% decrease uh, improvement in quantum noise power, um, that's to say 30% less noise power, what we're really doing is kind of observing into our universe about two times farther. So it's something like two times more universes in our purview now as we've reduced the quantum noise in the detectors. And just to highlight again, um, we're able to get to this level because of, I think, in large part, our approach. Um, and so these uh, improvements that we made over the last three years between the third and the fourth observing run. These were kind of calculated improvements. We know that the interferometer has um, its own quantum noise dynamics. And so now we have the filter cavity, which optimally prepares us to kind of negate all the quantum noise across the band. Um, and so this upgrade to frequency dependent squeezing was very much designed knowing um, what the interferometer does to quantum noise. So it's now an optimal preparation. As well, we looked closely at our losses to see how do we get more squeezing? How do we get more quantum noise reduction? And when we look at our loss budget, what we see is that Faraday isolators, also a common optical component, um, that the losses were high and the number of passes we need to make through Faraday isolators um, was actually eating up a lot of the losses in the squeezer, which degrades the amount of quantum noise we can reduce. Um, and so we can increase our squeezing efficiency to get more squeezing if we reduce losses. And that motivated um, the move to better isolators now for the fourth observing run. And this loss improvement from three to 4% now to half to 1% has really um, improved losses in the system. As well, we see that mode matching is a big issue because all the LIGO um, cavities work together to make the interferometer sensitive, essentially. And we need to match from one cavity system into another, into another. And we go through about four cavities in the squeezer system now. And so now we've installed an active mode matching optics um, to be able to control and hopefully optimize the mode matching of the squeezer throughout the full interferometers. We also see that seismic noise can be an issue for um, scattered light. And so we have better suspensions and new suspensions across the squeezer system as well. Um, and so this is nice because it means that we can understand where our losses come from and understand what degrades squeezing in our full interferometer. We can build technologies that meet the design specifications um, from our modeling. And we can install those technologies and get everything working together and actually see improvements that are commensurate with our expectations, um, which is nice. And so where do we go from here? While we have four and a half dB of squeezing for 04, our target for this generation of detectors is first to reach 6 dB and try to reach 10 dB in this generation of detectors. And what that means um, in terms of how do we get there is that for the squeezer system, we need to reduce losses. Um, 
because what limits the observation of squeezing is essentially optical losses where you lose the squeezing and phase control, whether you can stay stably in squeezing. And so reducing losses, identifying losses and reducing losses is going to be a big part of the path forward here. Um, so that's kind of looking at what, how can we get um, higher performance optics and how can we get better phase control across the system, better matching as well in terms of the optical layout for the squeezing system. And so it's interesting to then think like, what do we get if we get more <laughs> squeezing astrophysically? Um, as we reach the design goals for this generation of detectors, um, we'll start to look even farther and farther into the universe reaching to over 10 plus billion light years back in time, we'll start to be able to see black hole collapses from an earlier generation of stars. And for next generation, if we want to go to 10 dB of squeezing for the um, full design, what you see for next generation detectors is that a large part of the noise will be limited by the purple line, which is um, vacuum noise, quantum noise. And so we'll see that next generation detectors as well as this generation of detectors, our outlook into the universe gravitationally will be limited by how much we can reduce um, quantum noise in our instruments. But if next generation detectors can really reach the levels of um, performance that they're hoping for with 10 dB of squeezing, that would be totally amazing. Um, you would be able to start to see gravitational signals out from the very first populations of stars that have collapsed. And, that would be incredibly exciting for cosmology. Um, and so just to wrap up, this is what our control rooms look like in terms of operating the detectors. Um, so this is, for example, the LIGO Livingston control room, um, LIGO Hanford control rooms. This is the LIGO MIT group um, where I come from. Um, the LIGO scientific collaboration is much, much larger than just the instrumentation group. Um, the full LIGO scientific con uh, collaboration is over 1,600 members, over 130 institutions across 20 countries. Um, and so this is a big scientific effort. And maybe I can leave us a little bit um, here with what can we discover as we squeeze away quantum noise. We've already seen a lot of uh, kind of exciting sources and a lot of exciting astrophysics as we've reduced the quantum noise in the detectors. Um, so of the population we had seen before the fourth observing run of the 90 detections, before that, um, few were detected before quantum enhancement and many were detected after. Um, so it's exciting to see what the future here kind of holds as we continue to reduce um, this big noise source in our detectors. And I'll leave you with this final picture and say thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to talk to you all. Um, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Victoria, for that excellent and informative uh, presentation. At least tried to clap. I know it's hard uh, on remote uh, talks like this. Um, yeah, so we have a number of questions. Uh, I'd like to invite the audience to continue submitting questions uh, if you're you know, motivated to do so during the discussion. Um, I'm going to start with just a, a nice little technical question which a uh, user had asked, what are the requirements on finesse for that filter cavity that you had uh, described? Yeah, so the finesse of the filter cavity, um, we're operating with a finesse of about 6,700. That's with an optical storage time of about three milliseconds and a cavity length of about 300 meters. Um, a finesse of 6,700 means a line width of about 70 hertz in terms of the peak, uh, the full width half max line width. So it's, I would say like quite a narrow band cavity <laughs> yeah, to operate yeah. at that length scale. <laughs> For sure. Um, it's not like a it, it narrow... astronomically large finesse, but it's extremely narrow line width given the length of the, of the cavity. Exactly. Yeah. And a big part of the design compromise is to say, um, how do we get a long optical storage time with minimal loss? Um, yeah. And a compromise there was to make a long cavity, um, a long cavity of moderate finesse, let's say, <laughs> um, yeah, nice. high but not insanely high, and still controllable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> staying on that theme, um, well, this is just general like uh, squeeze light quantum enhanced measurement. Uh, uh, there was a question about you know I think this is I'm curious to hear your answer because. 
you know, typically I think people naively assume that you squeeze like the main beam, but the main bright laser yep. beam here is not squeezed, right? But you inject, uh, you know, squeezed vacuum input. So uh, do you want to just give a little recap of that just to drive that home for folks? I think it's not, in, you know, intuitive to yeah. most folks. Oh, it's like completely non-intuitive, actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the light that comes out of the interferometer is, in essence, a regular laser beam. And so what you see kind of here in figure A is what a regular laser beam, kind, what the electric field of a regular laser beam basically looks like. It looks kind of like a sine wave. It oscillates, and it has this fuzziness on it. One way to understand kind of what squeezed light is doing is like exactly like you said, we're in essence adding in our own vacuum noise, which interferes with the quantum noise in the main beam. That's to say we're preparing this state here on the bottom left of the screen. That's what um, our squeeze light source prepares. This is summed with um, this, that's to say the squeeze light, which has on average um, a half photon of noise power in it. So um, especially for Thor Labs, this is probably a familiar concept. If you want to calculate what's the shot noise um, in your photo detector, if you want your experiment to be shot noise limited, uh, you would calculate you know, what the shot noise power is. Um, that is about half a photon of noise power for shot noise because there's always kind of, you don't know if there's zero or one photons in the vacuum field, there's kind of both. So your noise power is about half a photon <laughs> in the shot noise power. To say it on average doesn't really have any overall laser power in it. But what we do for squeeze light is engineer the correlations between pairs of photons. That allows us to have the same kind of average half photon noise power in the vacuum field, but it is structured in that sense of, you know, the squeeze vacuum state has correlations between pairs of produced photons. Those pairs of photons are correlated um, as part of the down conversion process where we send in one green photon, it produces two photons in red that come out of it in down conversion. One green becomes two reds. Um, and those pair of red photons that are produced have a certain phase relation. That phase relation is what we engineer to decide whether this squeezed vacuum beam that we send in interferes constructively or destructively with phase or with amplitude here. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of the sum the interference, if you more like the sum of this vacuum state here with the coherent state that comes out of the laser interferometer, which is a completely classical thing. The squeeze light essentially engineers whether we destructively interfere the power here and reduce the noise in phase, for example, creating a bright phase squeeze state, or whether we destructively interfere the amplitude noise in the laser field that comes out. That would be preparing a bright but amplitude squeeze state with reduced amplitude uncertainty where the reduction is compared to the normal quantum fuzziness that's uniform for all phases. Um, I don't know if that's a little bit more clear at all, but again, it's completely exactly as you said. Um, what comes out of the interferometer is a normal laser field. What the squeezer does and what we're doing with all of our squeezing stuff is deciding how can we, for example, reduce noise here to do phase squeezing or reduce noise here to do amplitude squeezing. And that's sort of the art. And, deciding how we prepare the squeeze state for the interferometer. No, I think that was a very nice explanation. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. We're going to jump to a very different topic. So switching to the astrophysics side and feel free mm -hmm. if it's, uh, you know, uh, not something you're totally comfortable with. I think, I think you got it. So <laughs> in the case of the neutron star <laughs> merger, can you explain yeah. the, why there's a delay between like, you know, the detection of the gravitational waves and then the, say the gamma ray signals, but then later on having the, like the optical and radio signals? Um, yeah. Like what yeah. describes and, that delay? Yeah. So one way to understand this is like, um, what are the different sources of the different signals? So for example, for um, neutron star mergers, the gravitational wave signal, like when do you actually produce that? you produce the gravitational wave signal as the two neutron stars kind of catch each other and then start to in spiral into a final object. And so you can imagine for a lot of that time, the matter inside these, um, one way you can describe neutron stars is like they're this insane gas of neutrons. But for a lot of their gravitational in spiral um, 
those masses are not exactly in contact with one another, meaning that those fusion processes don't start yet because what you're seeing gravitationally is the radiation from um, the moving masses and the deformation of those masses as they start to in spiral. That's what generates a gravitational signal and that's what we detect in, for example, the gravitational wave detectors on Earth. What you generate a gamma ray burst is, for example, the fusion processes that begin as the nuclear matter starts to interact and then nuclear fusion between these neutrons starts to happen, that, um, that fusion process emits gamma rays as part of the um, kind of product. Um, and so what you actually, you know, in some sense, you generate gravitational wave signals from the motion as they start to in spiral, which happens before necessarily the matter is in contact with one another. Even once the matter is in contact with one another, it takes time for kind of the interactions to begin. And if you have kind of new, um, gamma rays that are emitted, they can also get stuck by interacting with all the other stuff in the gases before they actually leave the kind of final coalesced object. So in some sense, you generate the gravitational signal early before the um, kind of collision is fully happening because you generate that as a signal of their motion and their change in the masses of the neutron stars. You kind of generate the, the gamma ray burst as like a flash once things start to fuse and merge. So that requires that the objects are really kind of coalesced and that the gamma rays you produce can leave the neutron star and not be stuck bouncing within each other. And so for something like the time delay from a neutron star um, burst here, uh, you do expect there's a delay for that. And then in terms of like the X-ray, the UV and the optical, one thing you'll notice on this chart here is that there is a time delay right between the gamma ray burst and the X-ray and the optical. There's something like a, you know, 10 to 12 hour delay here. A big part of that is just the fundamental difference in these methods of astronomy. Um, gravitational wave detectors, because we're detecting these ripples, like we can detect whether the sun is out, whether it's cloudy, all this stuff, because gravitational radiation doesn't care about the sun. It doesn't care, like, you know, is it cloudy on Earth today? And so um, in the gamma ray, it's again a satellite. So it also does not care as much if it's cloudy <laughs> or bright outside. Um, and so, but you see that for like X ray and UV and optical telescopes, they essentially had to wait until night fell to open their domes and begin observing. That is kind of an artificial, of course, time delay. <laughs> um, but it speaks a little bit to the difference between gravitational astronomy, where we're detecting these really ripples in space time, um, compared to optical telescopes, which have to open their domes and observe with telescopes, which can't really be done if it's cloudy, um, you know, all this sort of stuff. Uh, if it's bright outside, we need to wait for night to fall. And a big part of, you know, observing this event, I think 5, 6 a.m. Pacific time was waiting uh, until the first telescopes can open their domes and begin observing at night. Um, so there, there is some also kind of human or kind of not necessarily human, but, you know, it's an artifact of how optical astronomy works. But again, like the gamma ray burst has a fixed time delay. Also, the kilonova explosions from fusing up these heavier um, elements, what you see in the UV optical and IR, what um, that burst is from is from the kilonova transient, which is to say like you know, you're producing all these elements and then you see the glow of all those uh, at the atomic mm -hmm. transition lines of all the elements you're fusing. Yeah. But that all of that also requires first the matter is really merging and that has an expected time delay as well and that continues to glow for a long time afterward and that's what all these telescopes these optical telescopes um, are seeing in the different colors they're seeing different parts of the glow from um, the nuclear matter kind of fusing up to be heavier elements and that's a lot of also how we know like what elements are produced um, okay. by these mergers nice yeah very nice I'm going to, since time is limited, I'm going to give three more questions. One should be pretty quick and then two okay. kind of more open-ended. Um, sure. Can you, I know you mentioned this during the course of the talk, but can you just give a quick recap mm -hmm. of sort of expected rates of event for the near term? It doesn't have to be like future or anything, but uh, in terms of like binary black hole mergers, binary, binary yeah. neutron star mergers, how often do you expect to see these, say, in 04? So in 04 now, I can at least say kind of what we have so far. So far in four months, we've had at least 40 online detections. And in 03, we had um, 56 online detections. 
after 10 months. So the rate is, you know, order doubling already. That's bringing us from roughly weekly to roughly every couple days. Um, there are detections nowadays. Most of our detections are binary black hole merger objects. Um, we expect in at this sensitivity with the year observing order one binary neutron star merger. And that's because the rate of those astrophysically is just very low in our near universe. Um, and hopefully as we increase the sensitivity of our detectors even further, we'll be able to probe deeper into space. And the more volume you're probing, the more sources, you know, assuming a normal distribution will fall into there. Um, and so it's important to keep improving sensitivity. Um, but yeah, most of our objects that we see are binary um, black hole mergers. Yeah. Um, the question near and dear to my heart, so I'm gonna ask this one. Um, are, you mentioned this uh, thermal noise and specifically coding thermal noise issue that came up. Yes. Are there particular yes. types of coatings yeah. for these optics? Like what are currently used? What are potential solutions to reduce thermal noise? Yeah. Uh, in this? Yeah, reducing thermal noise is a tricky one. <laughs> um, it requires not only, it requires that we can kind of accurately measure the thermal noise of new coatings that we will install. So of course, like the test masses are very large, um, right? They're, you know, uh, like 80 pounds. So these are like large objects. It's very hard to produce coatings it's very different, as you know, to produce coatings for a one inch sample and produce coatings with that quality on such a large um, mirror, essentially. And so we need to be, we have a lot of um, measurements, especially here at MIT, that are looking at what is the coating thermal noise level for a one inch sample that we can measure externally in the lab. If um, this is kind of describing our process of how we're searching, right? Um, if we can find coatings that are like low absorption um, low Brownian noise um, in the lab, then we are more motivated to go and talk to our vendors and see, can they produce this um, on a larger scale? Um, I, I'm trying to exactly remember our current coatings are tantala and silicon. I want to say. Silica. Yeah, tantala silica. Sorry, yeah. silica. Yeah, and the next, the ones we are currently trying to find coatings that maybe if we act soon, we can put into production for the next observing run. Um, looking at whether, for example, um, Germania um, might be an interesting option there. Um, so for coating thermal noise, it's a hard thing to measure accurately um, in an external way to the detectors. And then seeing if our external measurements match up with what we see in our detectors is something we are in the process of doing now. Because just because we measure some um, Brownian noise level on a one inch sample doesn't mean that that will be the same as what we measure in the full detectors because the beam geometry is different, the manufacturing kind of situation will be much, much different. Um, and so right now we're trying to see is there what does the tension look like between tabletop measurements of CTN, coating thermal noise, and um, the ones really in the full detectors? And then hopefully if we can measure in a tabletop experiment things that have better uh, thermal noise performance and we're more motivated to try to produce it on the scale of the full test masses and commission that upgraded test mass. Beyond kind of, you know, of course, like crystal and mirrors, <laughs> crystal and mirror coatings are, of course, in the purview. And that is something we are looking hard at, I think. Um, we need to be able to kind of measure externally what this looks like. There have been, I think, tensions in the measurements, whether there's kind of mystery noise involved with crystal and mirrors, even at the one inch scale. And I think this is because this sort of installation require, you know, replacing eight test masses across the two detectors and each coating manufacturer will be a huge cost. Um, we kind of want to be sure that we know what we're getting into there. <laughs> um, but I think we're looking really hard at crystalline coatings um, for kind of next generation ones. But that, I think, will require. That's a longer lead time in terms of the R&D we'll need to do to be sure about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 but yeah, for sure. We're, we're getting there. I'll say from our side, we got we've delivered some 10 centimeter coatings and things look good. But yeah, there are some 
peculiar issues with these, especially cryogenic temperatures, yes. not necessarily room temperature. Especially at cryogenic temperatures. And even my impression was not at cryogenic temperatures there. It's not, it has not completely met the theoretical spec. <laughs> there yeah, are still, yeah. there are still some mystery noises and it's, you know, in terms of installing it in the full interferometers, like I think there's a, yeah, it's, it's true with all things. Um, I guess there are big systems that need to operate like this. It's like, there's a balance between pushing new technologies and pushing known technologies. <laughs> and hopefully you get the best coatings and push them to the level of, you know, known technologies. <laughs> so you know what you're in for. Um, yeah. But I think that will be one of the biggest challenges. Yeah, um, for sure. Coming it especially up. helps you, right? If you get lower noise coatings, then you can push squeezing to its yeah. ultimate limits, right? But if you're limited by brownian noise, that's a, that's a problem. All right, we'll run. We'll do yeah. one more question, and we'll try to. This is more just broad. I think it's a good fit with the you know Thor Labs hosted webinar. Are there specific yeah. technological developments that would help you? Um, so the question was, you know, what specific developments and technologies would you like to see that would help you, you know, uh, reach the the lofty goals that you're shooting for here? Um, that is a good question. I think a lot of it is that the system is very complex and there are a lot of technologies that would help. I think we're limited. I almost want to say we're more limited by people power than we are by technology. That's not entirely true because of course for something like coatings, really where you'll see coatings hurt us is in like the worst place, right around 100 hertz. So coatings would be a huge technological improvement if we can guarantee it. Um, yeah. Another thing is like the people power to find where all the squeezing losses are. Um, if you look at the optical layout, even this high level optical layout, you know, each arm is not simply one pass, it's actually a cavity. Um, there are so many places you can lose squeezing here. And a lot of it comes down to how accurate is our modeling? Can we validate the model? Can we confirm? Can we even understand, you know, all of the squeezing losses now? There are still unexplained losses in our squeezing. And that's a big part of my work is to understand, you know, where are all the squeezing losses? Because only if we find where they all are, can we make like a you know, kind of targeted improvement to reduce them. If they're just kind of mystery losses, but you can't really pinpoint where exactly they are, you can't really address them. And so I think like the answers to how we address it may be technological in the end, like maybe we need to have better photo detectors some places, maybe we need phase cameras, better wavefront sensors, but it may also be completely within the scope of current technology to address those issues if we identify them. Like, you know, maybe it is one bad mirror, but if there's a hundred mirrors on the path, can you find the bad one and replace that one, <laughs> for example, right? Um, so, so that's, that's I see it as like a people power uh, yeah. issue in terms of, can we make sense of everything at the same time and then make a decision about where to go in and what to fix? Um, that's hard. I just, you know, that's where we are at now. <laughs> no, that, that makes sense. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, we are 10 minutes over, so I'll, I'll cut it off. We'll, we'll pass along all the questions because, yeah, like we had predicted, it was a very dynamic Q&A, and there's a bunch more that we weren't able to get to. Some specific questions, some nice things about back action evading stuff that I think was a little too detailed for this, yeah. but um, I'll pass them along. Um, okay. So, yeah, once again, I'd like to uh, thank Victoria, Dr. Chu, for this very excellent presentation. I will note that on September 27th, actually just one week from today, we're gonna to have another webinar and this will be uh, internal speakers uh, covering nanotextured anti-reflection coatings. This is presented by uh, Long Fei Yi and Ryan Priori of Thorlab Special Works in South Carolina. So be sure to register for this event as always on our website at uh, thorlabs.com slash webinars. And thank you again very much, uh, Victoria, for that fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you to the audience for your attendance, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.